describe the work that we're doing uh, is a collaboration on several levels. First of all, between Carrigan, uh, where I've worked for many years, and uh, McGill, where I'm also, uh, that's my second affiliation. Uh, the work that we're talking about today is um, mostly uh, focused on uh, the two PhD students who are with me today, um, Johan and Derek, and uh, we supervise uh, these, these two guys with uh, Robert Kearney and I. Robert Kearney is the long-standing chair of the, uh, the ex-chair of the Biomedical Engineering Department of McGill. So, just uh, a disclaimer that uh, I'm also representing Perigen, which grew out of uh, McGill spin-off in the, in the 90s, uh, started by Dr. Emily Hamilton, who uh, is still working very hard in the field, although she's starting to uh, slow down. She had her uh, official retirement at the end of June, so we're, we're starting a new era uh, together. She's, she's not stopping completely, but she's, she's going to uh, work at a reduced level in the future. So we're now headquartered in, uh, in North Carolina, uh, region, and of course we're focused on obstetrics and specifically perinatal obstetrics, uh, obstetrics, although we are looking at pregnancy, of course, yeah, as a whole, uh, more and more. So the, the main study that we'll be talking about today is a collaboration between uh, McGill, uh, Perigen, and uh, UCSF in San Francisco. So we have a, uh, a really uh, exciting um, project going on uh, using data from 10 years or so from 15 hospitals. This is an NIH and Gates supported uh, effort. And uh, as I mentioned, Robert Kearney is in involved, Emily and, and myself, the Kerrigan. And importantly, we have some really uh, great clinicians, both uh, I mean, Dr. Hamilton is really our obstetrical uh, expert, but we also have a neonatologist involved, and um, Dr. Yvonne Wu is a neurological pediatrician, so this has uh, been very interesting to, uh, to have, have her work. Um, she's really pulled, pulled the, the, the project together, but Specifically, what she brings to it is uh, a very focused and careful uh, look at the data when we're trying to find the pathological, pathological cases and distinguishing, as, as uh, we heard yesterday, from um, babies who are injured uh, chronically before, before birth and, and, the, and the babies that we can actually do something. Uh, to prevent injury during birth. So, for example, you looking at the MRIs of these babies, we can, to some degree of, of uh, confidence, determine which babies were injured uh, before birth and which were likely injuries that happened during uh, labor and delivery. So that's helping us uh, get a better labeling of our data uh, for, for these sick babies. This is the, uh, the group here. Um, so these are the UCF, UCSF people, uh, Michael and uh, Yvonne. That's uh, Robert Kearney, Emily Hamilton, and this is uh, Marie. Uh, she's a, a Belgian uh, resident in uh, pediatrics, pediatrics, Johan and, and Derek, of course. And uh, we have IT. And uh, other support from Lawrence and uh, uh, Regine. So these projects that uh, Derek 
and Johanna are involved with are trying to, in the end, look at how we can assess the risk of developing HIE in uh, intrapartum cases uh, from two different perspectives. One, uh, which is the topic of, of our session, the, the deep learning, but before and in, in parallel, and maybe together with deep learning, uh, Johan is, is taking a more signal processing approach and also looking at more Big, the big picture in incorporating the clinical data from of, about the mother into the models as well. So uh, we have uh, both uh, high income and lower income and middle income countries as target clinical settings with the, the constraints, different constraints for those settings. Um, and of course, we are doing this trying to compare it to the best uh, approximation to how um, clinicians make these decisions uh, when we're working with retrospective data. So we, we use the pair rules rather than the NICH rule, uh, in addition to the NICH rule, but of course uh, this, these American rules are, are very limited because um, many of the risk or unknown cases fall in, in the middle, and that's 70% or 80% of the data. The pair of classification is a five level classification, which provides a little bit more great gradation, and we, we like it a little bit better. So, so many of these uh, slides you'll be very familiar with, but I'll just go over them quickly. Um, HIE occurs in from one to seven in a thousand uh, babies. And uh, it's estimated that half of these could be preventable because they're currently re related to uh, preventable medical care, which is a, a huge number. And even if we quibble about whether it's 50 or 40 or 30, it looks like we have room to do some really important work to prevent. Uh, we, it's been shown that fetal monitoring, with all its faults, has been able to reduce at least the catastrophic cases. Um, but I, I'm, I think we can uh, do much better. Uh, so here's a, a quick look at the cesarean section rates uh, around the world. Um, of course, the US was near the top, but even above that is Latin America. Canada is close to the U.S., the EU is a little, a little bit less, and Asia and Africa uh, following. So when clinicians are uncertain, intervention is, is uh, going to be happening, and this is really uh, driven by legal uh, ramifications, especially in, in the U.S., and I, I think I need to update this slide because inflation is probably pushing that number higher. So C-sections are uh, clinically and uh, economically costly, so there's a lot of work uh, possibility to re reduce problems when we're talking about such a common uh, medical condition as, as uh, pregnancy and childbirth. So EFM, or cardiophotography, uh, looks at the uterine pressure and FHR. Uh, in the US and Canada, at least, uh, it's a routine measurement for 90% of, of births. And, and uh, the main thing to look for is the response of, of the baby to these maternal contractions here, uh, decelerations, respond to these contractions and uh, the shape and, and duration, the, 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 the depth and, and duration of these uh, responses are indicative of the degree of insult of the baby, especially as we, we don't look at single events, but um, a series.
series of events. Of course, CTG, is, as we've heard yesterday, is a very noisy signal, uh, subject to just losing the sensor, but also uh, the internal heart rate, um, jumping into the fetal heart rate signal and uh, not getting filtered out properly. And the, the key thing to, to that, that is one of our challenges for, for many of us here is that we, we use this as a as our main um, uh, non-interventional uh, monitoring strategy, but it's really giving us an indirect measure of what we're really interested in, and that is uh, fetal hypoxia. And of course, there's been no problems uh, in, in the clinical domain with a lot of variability in, uh, and subjectivity in the analysis. Uh, this is uh, some screenshots of the Perigen patterns uh, system for, uh, for a couple of cases where we see a lot of B cells. Uh, here, the, the contractions are, 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 are detected. The X cells are in green, and below a, a an episode where we have mostly contractions and these cells. Um, the reason that Perigen has developed uh, this patterns uh, uh, solution is to relieve uh, clinical staff from from their tedious aspects, which they, they historically done manually and, and noting the the incidence of these events uh, as they happen one by one. Hopefully this will free them up to look at these really important uh, and, uh, trends and tendencies. Back in uh, 2005, 6, and 7, we developed the first patterns uh, product. Um, this was before the, the wave of, of machine learning, uh, post-2010 or so. Uh, and we got this through FDA, um, not not without uh, blood, sweat, and tears, but uh, it, as I will talk about later, we we have improved this product more recently, and the FDA is now looking very carefully and with a lot of scrutiny at any uh, AI or, or machine learning. So. What about uh, looking at the, the more the bigger picture and, and asking the question how, not not whether this is an acceleration or deceleration, which is interesting but very focused in time. But how is the baby doing? And and how could this help the clinician intervene at the right time and for the right reasons? So I'm going to let. Johan take over and talk about how he's working at, at, at this problem of making a better a determination of the fetal state for, for to help the clinician decide what to do. Okay, uh, good morning. Um, I am Johan, and I'm going to present my what I'm doing for my PhD. The main point of my PhD is to improve the prediction of risk of hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy in term infants, uh, and I am in the program of biomedical engineering at McGill University under the supervision of uh, Dr. Warwick and Dr. Kirby. The hypothesis of my thesis is that with the large cohort of data that we have of uh, about 250,000 CDG signals. We, if we use machine learning, we could improve the timely uh, prediction of the risk of HIE, and that's the main objective, to generate this machine learning algorithm. So my, the proposal of my thesis is that it's going to be structured in three main chapters, and I'm going to use that structure to uh, uh, go through my presentation. And the first chapter, or the first aim of my thesis is that, okay, we have all this data, all these CDG signals, 
And there are classical features, classical patterns that are being used right now at uh, bedside through visual assessment, like analyzing accelerations, decelerations, basement. Uh, so instead of using visual assessment, if we recognize these uh, patterns automatically using vertical patterns, and we use machine learning on them, how good of a prediction can we get? And I have started working on this, and my first uh, analysis is to use a, a semi-Markov parametrization of the sequence of these patterns. So I'm, in this initial analysis, I'm just interested in the timing between, between patterns. I, I am not including the magnitude of the baseline or the height of the deceleration. And the question was, are there difference in the parameters between those fetuses that had a normal outcome of the labor and those that developed HIV? We used, the, as I mentioned, the output of vertical patterns that showed us the changes in, this, uh, in these states or in these patterns that we can see here, uh, baseline moving onto an acceleration onto a baseline. And we also had information on the length of each of these patterns. So we built the semi Markov chain models that uh, I'm going to describe briefly. So this is the fetal heart rate model where we have three main states, the baseline, the acceleration, and the deceleration. And what we model is that, okay, if, we, if, if the signal is in a baseline pattern and it's allowed to transition into a different one, what is the probability that the next pattern is going to be an acceleration or a deceleration? Similarly, the other two uh, patterns have this pair of transition probabilities. And then we also ask the question, okay, how long do we stay in a baseline before we move on to a different pattern? And that's known as the dwell time here, or the baseline, the acceleration, the deceleration. And we did something similar for the uterine pressure signal. So unfortunately, I cannot show you to the detail the numerical results of this because it's about to be presented uh, uh, next week. But the main results that we found was that decelerations were more probable. So the transition uh, of baseline to deceleration had a higher probability in the HIA group for up to 12 hours before delivery. The decelerations were also longer. The dwell time of the decelerations was longer in the HIA group for up to four, eight hours before delivery. The baselines were shorter for up to four hours before delivery. And the resting intervals were shorter in the HIA group um, for up to 12 hours before delivery. So what, what's next for this analysis is to include uh, also distributions of, what are, of the magnitude of the patterns, like what was the baseline, uh, the slope of the baseline, the area of the deceleration, like as many uh, magnitude uh, parameters that we can extract from these uh, classical patterns and then find if they show differences and we can include them in a, in a machine learning approach. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the, second, um, the second aim of my, of my PhD is, okay, we, we generated this, this is the best prediction that we can uh, generate with a machine learning model after uh, extracting uh, information from the classical features. Now, there are plenty of uh, other fetal heart rate variability features that are being used in the, in the literature right now, and we can validate uh, their effectiveness or their performance in the machine learning classifiers thanks to the size of our data set. So the next uh, question is, adding fetal heart rate variability, does it add more information for the classifier? Would it, will, would it improve the prediction? Uh, I've made some analysis on the trends of the field of, of some fetal heart rate uh, variability features um, that I presented last year at Computing in Cardiology. The main result that I found was that, very interestingly, the mean of the fetal heart rate was larger in the HIE group that is in red with respect to the normal group uh, that is in blue. And these differences were significant for up to six hours before delivery. Um, I also analyzed uh, the frequency domain features, but I did not find uh, a very clear trend or difference between the two groups. And we also found these three uh, results for the approximate entropy, the standard deviation of the fetal heart rate, and the deceleration capacity that 
they seem to be <coughs> related to each other because if you consider that the as I showed before, the, the decelerations were more probable in the HIE group, while decelerations are um, are kind of a slow, high uh, amplitude changes. So the approximate entropy makes sense that it would reduce with time and it would be uh, smaller in the HIE group uh, as we get closer to delivery. And if we have more decelerations in the HIE group, then uh, the standard deviation is also going to increase and the deceleration capacity as well. So I need to continue performing more, more analysis where I reduce the correlations of these results to see if, uh, if the, three of the, the three of them are showing the same, telling the same story or if they have uh, some independent um, information that we can gain from them. So the conclusions of this analysis was that uh, frequency domain features did not uh, show much variation, but the average or the mean of the fetal heart rate was different for up to six hours before labor, and um, the approximate entropy, the fetal heart rate uh, variability, and the deceleration capacity varied with time and were, were more discriminative towards the end of labor. Now, uh, something that it's uh, important to consider here is that we're showing that there are parameters that vary a lot with time which adds another complication to the development of a machine learning classifier because the threshold that you could find for six hours before birth is not going to be the threshold that is going to work three hours before birth. So the development of machine learning classifiers will require to consider the time varying behavior of these signals. Finally, the third aim of my PhD is to use parameters of a system, system identification model that uh, quantifies the cause-effect relationship between the uterine pressure signal and the fetal heart rate to see if this, uh, this type of parameters would improve even more the prediction of uh, the risk of HIE. I have just started to work on this uh, a couple of months ago, so I don't have much results to show, but. Um, I'm going to show just a, a, a model that I generated recently. So we know that fetal heart rate responds to uterine pressure changes. And Dr. Warwick showed uh, about 10 years ago that the li linear models uh, can uh, quantify this relationship. However, we also know that most physiological systems tend to be nonlinear. And for that reason, we started to explore the inclusion of nonlinearities in these models. Um, for the generation of the model that I'm going to show, I use these two signals. This is a 20 minute window where we have the uterine pressure as the input of the system and the fetal heart rate of the output. And this is the system that was generated. So this is a static nonlinearity, meaning that uh, for a certain um, amplitude of the uterine pressure, this is the output that we get, um, and then the nonlinear output goes through a, a filter that in this case is a low-pass filter, and that generates the, the uh, predicted field of heart rate. Now, something that I am starting to see in the models of the nonlinearities is a, is a behavior that uh, resembles a halfway rectifier which means that for for instance in this case for up to about 15 um, in the amplitude of the uterine pressure the response of the system is close to zero meaning that if the if the variations in the uterine pressure are too small there's no going to be any response in the fetal heart rate but then as when, when it gets larger, the response becomes larger too until it reaches a saturation point where even if, it, if the uterine pressure increases more, the response of the fetal heart rate is not going to become larger. And just to finish, I'm going to show you the prediction. As I mentioned, this is a, the linear model that was identified is a low-pass filter. So what we're showing here in red is the prediction that it's a, uh, following the the slow trend of the signal of the fetal heart rate, but uh, there is still more work to be done here to improve the, the predictions and see if the parameters of the models are important. 
So for the future in this particular uh, part of my work, I'm going to include all the CDG traces. Right now I'm just working with a couple of uh, HIE cases. The signal that I show you was an HIE case. And um, we will have to compare across groups if the parameters that these models um, estimate um, are different across the two groups and how do they evolve with time because as I mentioned before these signals do vary with time, they're non-stationary so the systems that quantify the relationship between these signals are also going to be time varied. Uh, I'm going to let my point talk now. Good morning. So as part of the project, I'm doing the deep learning experiments using the electronic fetal signal monitors. My experiments are of Kenny, Philip and Rico. So our research, my research hypothesis include that uh, we can use deep learning models to predict HIE and acidosis using two concepts. There's the raw EFM signals and then the transformed versions of these EFM signals. So my ongoing experience is currently looking at doing the raw EFM signals where I downsampled the epithelial signals. I randomly have sampled the healthy records because we have, we have a lot of healthy records as compared to the HIE cases. And we currently have four hours of signals uh, before delivery, which we uh, segmented into 20 minutes long one of the segments. My current experiment I use on the LSTM model with 10 foot computation and the repeated trials. And then for the test, so I'm doing a train test, a train validation in the training stage, and I'm reporting the sensitivity, sensitivity and the accuracy of the test performance. So I'll be presenting the majority of these results at the uh, upcoming CNC, so I'll just give a snapshot. So we noticed a trend. So if I uh, if you look at the first plot, the AUR at the top, uh, we see close to delivery. Um, my plot is inverted, so I'm moving from 12 hours before delivery to zero, which is at the time of delivery. So you see the AUR of the models are uh, currently trained, improves towards delivery. As the sensitivity is related to the HIE cases also improves as the red plot at the bottom improves from 12 hours up to zero at the spot about to deliver. But the sensitivity of the normal cases is currently not uh, very uh, between 0 0.8 and 0 0.6, which would need some more time to work on. I'm still training the models and hopefully hoping to make a good performance in this aspect. So uh, my future is going, I'm going to continue looking at the raw EFM signals. And as you already know, most, I'm currently only focused on the FHR signals. Mm -hmm. So I'll be trying to incorporate the maternal heart rate and then uterine pressure. That's how I look at multi-channel single-channel experiments. And some of the literature also uh, recommended looking at the transformed versions of these signals. Yeah. And, and the, the following this, and, and in, in parallel with what Derek has done so far, uh, we'd like to incorporate some unsupervised and semi-supervised strategies because, as we know, uh, the baby, <coughs> we, we put them in these clean categories uh, based on uh, the objective outcome, at least that's been our approach, the objective outcome information that we have at birth. But what, what, what was the state of that baby uh, one hour, two hours, and, and earlier? Uh, we hope to be able to use uh, semi-supervised, especially, uh, kinds of approaches to uh, uh, allow the, 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 the target effectively to, to adapt to the data. So that's, that's uh, an overview of our work and uh, uh, thank you for your, for your, uh, your time. Thank you. So we have time for questions. I would make a quick comment just to say I'm glad to see you progressing and getting all that data. Not easy. It takes a long time. So congratulations to the students. Not easy. So keep going. And I'm so happy to see this presentation today. That's all I'm going to say. So I, <coughs> I join you. I think the, 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 the quality and the, the amount of data is, is very impressive. And uh, also the, the funding institutions, so that's, that's uh, remarkable. 
Uh, you also mentioned that there is uh, FDA reviews have been going on, have been completed years ago, and that there are still uh, reviewing this. And you mentioned now uh, an initial study where you had compared the assessment of three obstetricians with the assessment of the pure system. And in one case, uh, well, there were, there, you, you said they were in the middle. So the, the system was in the middle, and the, the experts, so called experts, were either above or below. Uh, this is a fundamental problem, I think, in the field, that if you have a gold standard that is suboptimal, how do you improve this somehow? And my question is, this specific topic, was this being criticized or examined by the FDA, or, or have they reached the status where they do not care about this any longer, because they say, pardon? They, they care a lot. They care a lot. They, sorry, I'll let you. No, no, I mean, this, this yes, was my question. Well, as, as we talked about yesterday, uh, my experience has been with uh, regulatory uh, approval is that you're left on your own to bootstrap your own validation process and they, at that point, roll up their sleeves and decide whether they like your protocol and, and often they, they like some of it and they don't, they don't like other parts of it and it's been an iterative process to come up with a because there's no gold standard, because you create a, uh, a bronze standard, um, it's, it's quite uh, iterative to try and come up with something that they, they feel is uh, acceptable, and, and that the bar has definitely gone up. Uh, more questions? Um, is your database uh, of two, 250,000 uh, tracings, uh, uh, they are all uh, acquired the same frequency with the same systems or they, they uh, are provided by different system and different uh, uh, frequency? <coughs> Because we're using uh, data from the same hospital system, the Kaiser Permanente uh, hospital system, there is some uh, uniformity in the data acquisition, but it's not 100%. There's, there's uh, GE fetal monitors, there's uh, Philips GE monitors, uh, Philips monitors, but the, these protocols have, I, I won't say they're the same, at, for the, at the level of heart rate, they're, they're pretty interchangeable. Uh, the four, four hertz uh, standard, at least in, in North America, uh, that's the standard. Thank you. Thanks. Um, Phil, I'd like to echo um, Antonia's and um, Martin's um, congratulations on the sterling work you're doing around this area. My question though is things like accelerations, decelerations, baselines, and those things sort of human methods of assessing fetal heart rate. Uh, therefore, training your systems to sort of work on the same basis is almost as though you're replicating the same errors that we as humans have made. Yeah, it's, it's a great point and, and it kind of explains why we have these two uh, approaches. We have uh, Johan working on classical approaches with, with classical uh, uh, features more uh, aligned with clinical interpretation of these, these baseline of these XL events. Whereas uh, Derek is not uh, ignoring that information but stepping away from it a little bit letting the data speak. Mm -hmm. um, I think we, we need a, a dialogue between these extremes, between the informative clinical uh, opinion um, in the models and, and the, the, the more uh, non-parametric, what, what does the data say?
Hi, thanks. Um, I think what you're doing sounds really exciting. And as, as a clinician, I'm just a question about the when you're using the amplitude of a contraction from a CTG. So I know from experience when I'm like looking after somebody who's got a large BMI or moving about a lot in labour, that you know, a doctor or somebody might come into my room and think this woman's not contracting very much without looking at the CTG. Um, but I know because I've sat and I've put my hand on her that actually she's contracting, those contractions are strong to palpate and they occur in maybe three to four in ten. But because of challenges with monitoring in labour, that's not reflected on a CTG. So I'm just, my question really is how do you know that the amplitude of your contraction is relating to the strength of that contraction? In bearing in mind the difficulties we have in practice with monitoring uterine activity, particularly with larger BMIs, I wonder if that, if that was something you come across. The short answer is we don't know. Um, <laughs> the contraction is a very noisy signal to, a very tricky signal to analyze because, as you mentioned, the if we talk about the amplitude, the gain of the contraction cannot be uh, compared across subjects on, or even for, for the same person uh, at different hours if there was a movement in the sensor it cannot be compared and uh, sometimes you can see that the resting intervals are at a certain baseline and then there's movement and then it's around here so not the offset, not the gain, so what can we compare? Uh, I'm still working on that to figure out if there's a way to normalize it or not, but uh, it's, it's definitely a, a tricky situation and something to consider. More questions? And, and we have we have that information. Right. Uh, the, the problem is that the TOCO is by far in the majority of, of the cases. And and for that reason, we we've thought about partitioning the, the analysis. What what's going on with with the internal probe when we can maybe rely on that amplitude more and and maybe draw insights a better analysis of, of the total. Any other questions? <clears throat> I have a question. Um, so deep learning methods uh, have provided fabulous results in computer vision, for example, where uh, it is somewhat easier to train the deep learning methods because uh, we have clear labels and uh, how would you describe the interaction of, uh, of your methods and uh, the uh, experts that you use for uh, getting some sort of counters? So how would you describe uh, 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 in the training process the interaction of your methods with uh, the opinion of experts? How do you use the experts in your uh, during training? Currently, you know, our database, uh, it's a case they choose to buy, that's using the supervised test, the supervised learning method, the LST, I mean, the methods that we use, it's a case we actually defined by clinicians. Uh, um, specify the question. So, uh, what you're trying to do is, what you're trying to do, I assume, is you want to monitor during time. So, things change over time. And do you have information about what's going on over time uh, by experts, or how does it work in your approach? <laughs> so, currently, uh, the current database I'm using with the 12 hours has a label for the whole 12 hours data based on the outputs label. Like, I don't have based on like, the first one hour, the first two hour. I don't have that defined by the community. It's, it's another approach the clinicians or the team can look at to label those. So I think first, what I wanted to point out is 
I'm using the whole 12 hours as I'm assuming this data is normal from the first uh, from the 12 hour to the zero hour, but in some instances for the HIV cases, the baby might have been normal the first uh, 12 to 6 hours and became abnormal at the last date. If you notice, that's where the next approach I try to look at, based on the results I have, I'm going to focus on the last six hours or last four hours, where I'm, I'm more confident now that the HIV issues developed as compared to the uh, previous data state. Yes, and, and that, that, that speaks to this semi supervised uh, approach. That it, it, it may be clean that, that the last three hours the diagnosis was already presented. But that may not be the case. Maybe it was earlier, maybe it was later. And how do you re remove that constraint on your modeling that uh, you know, HIE babies were HIE from the beginning and normal babies were normal until the end? Thank you. Well, let's call for questions. We have time. All right, let's thank the presenters. Thank you.